what I've been doing in recent streams, we watch, uh, for example, the pseudo video and you can ask questions about it and I add additional context to the video. So if you have not understood something about this, hopefully with my additional context, you can understand it more. Now this video is less technical, so I assume there are not that many questions or things I can say, but let's see. It's more about, you know, setting up the stage to go for the next technical steps. And by the way, this uh, the thumbnail was done on stream with viewers giving ideas and uh, you know, we made it on stream. I think there's a video on Live Underflow, my second channel, if you want to see how this amazing thumbnail was made. I actually like this thumbnail. I think it's a good thumbnail. Let's head in. It's time. In this video, we will discuss possible exploit strategies for sudo. In the past eight episodes, we have used fuzzing to rediscover the crash in sudo edit. We have analyzed the crash with address sanitizer and found the loop that causes a memory corruption. And then we looked at the root cause in detail. And now- Wait, I forgot the chapter markers. I forgot the chapter markers. I didn't enter the chapter markers here. That sucks. Cause in detail. And now it's time to make a plan for exploitation. How can we turn this memory corruption in sudo into an actual privilege escalation exploit? Let's head in. For heap exploitation, there are basically two strategies. First, you can exploit the heap implementation itself, so attacking the heap metadata, or you can attack the data stored in the heap. Let's think about exploiting the heap metadata first. You can allocate, you, you can call malloc to allocate memory on the heap and you can call free to free the memory. These are very abstract concepts you as a programmer use. How this is actually implemented, simply speaking, you just have a chunk of memory. You just, uh, the program at the beginning basically allocates a huge chunk of memory. So there's actually memory allocated already, okay? But that is not being used yet. And when you call malloc, some, the, this malloc function, all what it does is it manages this memory area. So it looks, oh, where's their space? And it returns you an address, a function, uh, a pointer uh, to that memory area. And then you can use that and you can write data into it. And when you need more memory to save somewhere, you can store it somewhere else. And the cool thing is about the heap, you can also call free. So memory you don't need anymore can be freed. And then when you call malloc again, it can reuse that part for other stuff. So and um, so first of all, you have just data on in this memory, right? When your program uses data, wants to allocate something and store something in the heap, that data is on there. So when we have a heap overflow and we can all write stuff on the heap, so of course you can all write that data stored on there. But um, besides the regular data that you just stored there, there's also heap metadata. So heap metadata is just additional bits and bytes that are used internally by the malloc function or the free function to manage these different uh, memory blobs because it needs to keep track which memory is in use, which memory is free, which can we reuse and so forth. And so there are some additional bits and bytes for that memory management. And um, should memory, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I answer that in a second. So you have this metadata. So when you have a heap overflow, you can of course overwrite the regular data, but you will also overwrite these bits and bytes that are used for managing this memory area. And so when you think about um, using this heap overflow for exploitation, you, you have to ask yourself, um, will I, do I wanna carefully control these bits and bytes managing the heap and can I do something evil with that? Or do I overwrite regular other data on the heap? Now we have a question in chat. Shouldn't memory be zeroed before freeing it? Not necessarily. As a, so it doesn't, what, what, when you say shouldn't, uh, when you mean it should be zeroed, uh, what do you mean by that? Because you have, so, so f you as a programmer, when you free memory, uh, you can malloc again and reuse it. In your code, you should always assume that the memory might not be zeroed. And so uh, your code should already, you know, ensure that when you reuse area, it doesn't um, expect that it's zero on the heap. This can happen. And even if you zero your, your memory before freeing it, uh, 
because of this heap metadata, these uh, these bits and bytes that are used for you know managing the heap, they are not zero, and they are out of from efficiency reasons not necessarily um, set to zero or overwritten. They might still be around. For example, when chunks are consolidated into one big chunk, I don't believe that the stuff in the middle is zeroed out. So you can still end up with a heap that is non-zeroed. Uh, and so your other code that allocates stuff on the heap should never assume that the code by default is zero. Uh, so that's the only real reason, uh, that's one of the main reasons, um, I, I guess that would be one of the reasons why you would want to zero it, so you can always assume that the heap is zeroed, but you cannot assume that because of the heap metadata that might be around. The second reason is that there's an attack called use after free, where uh, you free a chunk, but the data still remains. Um, and then you allocate something else in its place, uh, and uh, and then that things there's something already allocated, something like that. So in some cases it could help against that, but not necessarily. No, use after free is a bit different case. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it's not. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't be really that important. It's not that important. Uh, yes, let me. Let me think for a moment. So, I mean, with use after free, you have two components that use the same memory. So nulling it wouldn't, you free it, but it's still being used, so you might still be able to write to it. But yeah, so null, zeroing it could sometimes maybe break that in some way, but no, it wouldn't necessarily help against use after free at all. I'm, what am I saying? Sorry, it's late. It's 9.30 p.m. in the evening. So uh, I might be a bit dumb today. If you have watched my exploit education playlist, then you might remember the videos about heap exploitation. The heap is basically a data structure with metadata. You can imagine it as a linked list. So here you can see this very old video of mine, the heap DL malloc unlink exploit, or yeah, episode hex 18 in 2000. Oh, sorry, the screen, I'm sorry. Uh, in 2016, I made uh, this video for the binary exploitation playlist, so it's part of it. Um, very mind-bending stuff. And this metadata, for example, contains the size of the chunk and some flags, like if the previous chunk is in use or not, blah, blah. Details are important right now. And in those old videos, we exploited a very old allocation algorithm called DL malloc. Not gonna lie, that heap exploitation of DL malloc was mind-bending and it is complex, but it also didn't have any mitigations, thus it was relatively simple. Nowadays, the default malloc algorithm is a bit more advanced. We have, for example, fast bins, which are different data structure, additionally to the regular heap that you might know. And the malloc algorithms also have gotten a bit more hardened. But only in some ways. For example, some techniques with fast bins are actually a lot simpler. But generally, in order to exploit the heap implementation directly, you need a specific order of memory allocations and free operations. So in CTF challenges, you often have some kind of menu where you can create or delete stuff. And then you can perform the exact order of mallocs and frees you need. Yeah, so this is very important. In typical heap exploitation CTF challenges, you get some kind of menu and you can already s assume from these menu points that s either malloc or free operations are being done. So the list ingredients will, for example, there might be an array that points into the heap and will just print it. Add ingredients, certainly allocate something uh, on the heap. Create receipt, the same. Um, examinate an ingredient will read from that memory area. Delete receive, receive will be you know freeing some memory area, uh, and so forth. So, uh, and with heap exploitation, when you corrupt the heap metadata, so these are for example size fields or bits that indicate if something is used or not. Um, there's the, the wilderness um, value. It's that's the name of a value that indicates how much space is still left on the heap, the biggest free chunk basically. And in order to exploit these places, it's not as simple as overriding this one address and then the next time you use malloc something happens, um, not necessarily at least. Um, so you need a certain operations of allocations and frees where you in the middle, in between you overwrite something and then you allocate and free in the right order or things like that. It gets weird um, and complicated. And so 
it requires a bit more active uh, interaction. And we only have a heap buffer overflow. So we all write it once and then it has to do something. We, we have to get code execution somehow. And so we, we don't have a complicated uh, or we, we don't have that much control over what sudo does. We, we throw it at one input and things has, have to be fine. We don't have any interaction. This would be different if sudo were some kind of server software where you can, for example, if it's like an HTTP web server or something where you can keep sending different requests and actions and that will then, you know, set up everything how it has to be or an, an, some kind of input menu, a command line tool or something like this, right? But uh, sudo is just this one shot. That's why I consider this fairly unrealistic to be exploited in that way where you can create or delete stuff. And then you can perform the exact order of mallocs and freeze you need. But in our sudo vulnerability, we have a single shot overflow on the heap. We don't have any interaction with the program. And on top of that, we have to deal with ASLR. And the typical way of dealing with ASLR is to only deal with relative offsets or first have a bug to leak addresses, thus defeat ASLR, and then you can go further. But again, we don't have any interaction with sudo. We can't perform multiple overflows. We can't really decide how we want to allocate our free chunks. With our one overflow, we need to win. Yeah, so ASLR is another issue that we have, but we ignore uh, uh, that issue a bit for now. So with ASLR, the heap addresses would be randomized and the main program code as well. In a program where you have a lot of interaction, where you send some command and you get something back and send a command, like, like the CTF menu I showed before, you can set up your bug first in a way that it will leak addresses from memory. And when you leaked an address, based on that address, you can then calculate offsets and uh, basically you defeat ASLR. If you basically, you know, there's a random value and if you leak one address, you basically get that random value and now you know where the stuff is in memory. But again, we don't have that for sudo. It's one shot. We don't have this kind of interaction. So anything that would require us to, for example, overwrite a function pointer or overwrite an, a heap pointer or something in, in, the, in the free list or something like that, it's, it would be, you know, it's not really... It, we can't really do that. What you can do is partial overrides, uh, but yeah, that's a different thing. Yo, uh, zero X chips. Thanks so much for the uh, for the subscription. Thank you very much. That's why I believe attacking the heap directly, the heap algorithm, the heap metadata is unrealistic. I don't want to say it's impossible. People always find crazy creative ways, but I don't know any reasonable technique that we could try. So that's why I want to go for the second strategy, attacking data on the heap. Yeah, Twitch Prime, nice. Kasei, Kas, Kasei, Kasei's? Thanks for the Twitch Prime sub and Geek Masher as well. Thanks for, so much for the Prime sub. Twitch Prime is free with Amazon Prime, just FYI. You can steal your parents' Amazon account. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, I appreciate it. We have a heap overflow and we can overwrite arbitrary data in other chunks. And we don't immediately crash when we overwrite this data. We crash because of the side effects after we overwrote other data. We call this corrupting memory. So maybe there's some very interesting and useful data stored after our buffer that we can overwrite. As an example, if we find a function pointer on the heap after our chunk and it's then used afterwards, we could overwrite it. And when the function pointer is then used, at least we would have control over the instruction pointer. ASLR would still be an issue, but we could maybe do a partial overwrite. Whatever, <coughs> future problems, something like that would get us a huge step forward. But how can we find something like that? What do we need to make this work? This is actually the biggest question I had kind of myself. Um, you know, I, I, I know a lot of basics and I have a good foundational knowledge of all that stuff, but this kind of question, how do I identify useful stuff uh, on the heap, um, you know, the stuff that is after my overflow? And what kind of stuff can we overflow? 
That is a question that is very difficult to answer. There's no easy solution. It's, you can't say it's this and that. It's, it's very unique to each program. So you need some kind of methodology to figure this out and you need some creativity for each target individually, how you approach this, how you figure this out. Sometimes it can just be reading code because it's maybe small and there can only be so many objects. But something with sudo, it's a massive software. Oh, it's fairly big, um, and, but certainly there are even bigger uh, softwares as well. How do you figure out what you want to overwrite in memory? What This, this is one of the, I, I think, important questions that differentiate a professional you know, somebody who is like doing professional exploitation work or something from somebody like me who kind of just has foundational knowledge. This this was one of the most important and most challenging parts of uh, trying to exploit sudo. Finding the vulnerability, throwing some fuzzing against it, reading source code, that I can understand that. But now the creativity of exploitation, that is like the true question for me. I believe around that time I was also tweeting about exactly this issue and asked um, if people have tips for that or something. Uh, I should have dug out that tweet. It's probably a long time ago, so it's probably not so simple to find. But uh, yeah, uh, people, there was some insightful comments on Twitter. Maybe I should look that up uh, later. But yeah, this is one of the most difficult things. Um, uh, because it's not simple to answer. There's no easy answer for this. As I said, it's unique. Uh, to everything. <laughs> You're a superhero. Another five gifted subs. Thanks so much. We have completed a hype train. Uh, that's awesome. Welcome everybody. Thanks so much. So yeah, so let's see what my first idea was because I thought about this. I was walking my dog and thought about stuff. How, what do I want to try out? How, how can I you know, look into that? Let's look at the heap again with heap chunks in GDB. Here's our buffer. Now, how could we know what is stored after it? What is the meaning of this data? How could we know if there is a function pointer? So if, for example, sudo would be a program that is handling files a lot, you know, reading and writing files some config files maybe or something. You know, it does read some files like etc shadow or something like that. But uh, maybe look just looking at the heap and looking at the data afterwards, you know, if there would be a file path, you know, we could maybe say, okay, let's try overwrite that. Maybe something interesting happens with that file path. So, you know, that is one option you could try to go for, but clearly, yeah, yeah. Or maybe, you know, we could think maybe we could all write root here with our username. Maybe that helps us in some way. We don't know. That is now creativity and exploration. But um, I, from my, again, my programming experience and so forth, I, I don't have like huge, uh, I, I don't think that it's very likely to just look at it like this and finding something. So I, I think I have to go for something else. This is probably the most subs I've gotten in a single stream. Yeah, choo-choo. That's not easy. And maybe there is no function pointer here at all. But that's not the only question we should investigate. Check out this. The allocation of our buffer happened right before we caused the overflow. Time-wise, right? The program is getting executed. At some point, we look at the heap. So the heap screenshot I showed you know, happened at some point during the execution. Actually, it happened right after we allocated our buffer. So execution-wise, our allocation happened at the last point. And still, our buffer was in the middle of everything else. So that means there's something else that we have to think about. So it's the last chunk that was allocated. But our buffer is not at the end of the heap. This means that during the execution of this program, memory was allocated and freed many times. And there was a hole in the middle where our new buffer could. So depending on how large our buffer is or how large other stuff is, our buffer could be put into different holes. In our case here, the zeros, that is our buffer, was just allocated in this hole. You can see there's other data before and after it. This means not only have to we have we have to think about what is allocated after our buffer and if there's something useful that we can overwrite, but we have to think about this buffer could be in many different places. In what place 
helps us the most. It makes it even more difficult. If it would be very static and we would always have this buffer before these other buffers, then that wouldn't be a question. We can just analyze now what is allocated afterwards. We could even like note down the address, we could do some debugging and look exactly where these chunks have been allocated and note them down and investigate if there's anything useful. But our problem, it's not really a problem, but the challenge is, or the opportunity, because it can also be something positive, we can influence what, where on the heap it will be placed depending on if there are holes in the allocations where it is placed. And that changes what we can overwrite. So how are we going to analyze all those different options? That is one of the main challenges that we will face soon. Fit in. This means depending on the size of our buffer, we could end up in different places to rephrase this, depending on the length of the arguments, so the size we allocate, we might have a different heap chunk after the buffer we can overflow. But that's not all we have to research. We have no clue what influences the sizes of other heap chunks. If you casually scroll through the allocated chunks, here's a chunk with the folder path and here's what looks like environment variables, which means if you have a different set of environment variables and probably many other things that influence what sizes of chunks are allocated on the heap, the hole where our buffer will be allocated might be in completely different places. The whole heap could be arranged very differently if you control this other data. So these animations, I don't know if that was clear to you what I tried to do there. This, these animations, so before I started the pseudo series, I actually made a big summary video. Maybe it's in the recommendations here. Yeah, this, this video here, uh, how pseudo on Linux was hacked. Um, this is basically the summary of the complete research that we are now doing in detail. And I made these animations for this video. So if you just want a quick summary of the pseudo exploit and how everything went down, this is your video. These videos are very detailed. They are intended to be, you know, uh, for those that kind of want to follow along. Uh, so yeah, let's look at this animation. So in this animation, you have to imagine these are two different heap configurations. So this is a heap and this is a heap. And we look at how the heap chunks are allocated depending on the size of an environment variable that is placed on the heap. So this is just an example. This environment variable has a different length and it will influence the how the heap will be allocated. So these are allocated heap chunks, okay? And at the start, they are still, uh, at the start, they are still the same. So you have to pay attention. You will It will always allocate the same, uh, let, let's actually slow this down and just watch it slowly. Uh, it will always allocate the same heap chunk. Look, a big one was allocated, still the same heap. This was freed, this was allocated, still the same heap. The big one is freed, and now we allocate a different size of the, uh, of the environment variable, and you can see they have different length on the heap, and this influences and changes everything now. Now, when we allocate this bigger chunk here, it doesn't fit into here. Now, this in this heap configuration, using this long environment variable, it has to place this chunk at the end, while when we had a shorter environment variable, it was able to place it here. And now you start like completely differently. Now here, the small one did fit right after it, but couldn't fit in here, so it had to be placed at the end. And suddenly, the heap is completely different. Which objects follow, you know, how? And so we keep, f now, and when this buffer is, for example, freed at some point, then this is freed, then here is freed. Here, new stuff could be allocated. There was space in both of us, so that is the same. But now we allocate this one here, so there's a smaller hole, and here is a bigger hole now. Now, this was about actually exploiting it, so service user struct is something that comes later during exploitation. This was to visualize and understand uh, how we can overwrite the service user. But this is an important struct later that we will learn about. And so, you know, we keep uh, freeing stuff and now we allocate the buffer that um, that we overflow. So this is the buffer with the heap overflow. Here we can overwrite stuff. And so in this heap configuration, the service user is after us now. So we can overwrite into this struct, 
while in this heap configuration, when we keep writing, we keep to the right, you know, we will never overwrite the service user. We just keep writing to the right. So you see how influencing certain values can influence how the heap looks like, which influences what comes after our buffer, which is another question that we need to ask ourselves. How can we figure out the heap configuration that helps us the most? That is, you know, that is the real challenge in all of this. It might be in completely different places. The whole heap could be arranged very differently if you control this other data. What does this mean? Does this make it easier or harder? On one hand, this means we might be able to carefully control where we want to place our buffer and overwrite the right thing. On the other hand, it might not work on other systems. Either way, we got to try. And by the way, this careful planning and arrangement of heap chunks is called heap feng shui. Feng shui, feng shui is a pseudoscience where... I was being told that feng shui is the correct pronunciation also in Chinese. And this is fake. Feng Shua was wrong. I typed it into, I went into Google and I typed in Feng Shua, Feng Shui, and I went on, I probably had it on English or something, and then I clicked on listen. Feng Shui. Oh, Feng. Oh, Feng Shui. Feng Shui. Okay, okay I, maybe, maybe I thought it said Feng Shua, but it was Feng Shui. Feng Shui. Feng Shui. Feng Shui. Okay. I mean, I did this wrong in two videos, I believe, now. Uh, you use the energy forces to harmonize individuals with their surrounding environment, or in other words, the pretty arrangements of objects in a room. And I think there is no better word that could describe this for heap exploitation. Harmonize the heap chunks perfectly so that our exploit can work. It's kind of magical. Anyway, I'm not a pwn expert. To be honest, I rarely solve pwnable CTF challenges. I know many won't believe me because I made the binary exploitation series. I must be an expert and do that all the time, but that's not true. This pseudo exploit feels a bit out of my league. I think I have the skills to attempt it. I have some ideas I want to try, but maybe I will fail. And that's totally fine for me because I know by trying this, I will learn a lot. Actually, I have already learned so many new things working through this project and it is already a success for me. Remember, other people have done the research and there are many good exploits already, but that's not the point. We use the pseudo vulnerability to learn and it's cool that others have written exploits already because if we get stuck or if I get stuck, I can always look at the other exploits for inspiration. So either way, huge success for me. Uh, no, it's not a porn export. I said pwn export, which comes from pony, you know, like uh, horses, a horse pony. So that's what it's about. That being said, what should be our next steps? I have two ideas I want to combine. The first idea is to write a tool that helps us. Okay, so now we come to kind of like my, the ideas, I had, we'll come to why it's not necessarily my idea, but um, the strategies. So I thought about this, you know, like how can we deal with the heap? How can we figure out what to exploit? And here I share you what I thought might, could work for the exploitation. I, as I said in this video, and as I said earlier, I'm no expert in this. I, I have good fundamental knowledge, but I lack this kind of research experience, this digging into a big real life application and not just a CTF challenge. This was the first time I really dug into kind of a real life exploit like this. So, you know, this was all new to me, but this is exactly why I did this project. And this is exactly why I wanted to rediscover and do this myself and not just read the write up and solution of everything. I wanted to understand how researchers can figure that stuff out. Uh, that's the whole point of it. And so I need to go through the struggle of trying it myself. And if I fail, I can still look at the solution. So all is good. Um, but I wanted to try to figure out uh, um, how I could come up with my own exploit strategy. So here are my ideas now. I want to combine. The first idea is to write a tool that helps us enumerate or fuzz different heap configurations by controlling buffer sizes. 
But to be honest, this idea is not actually from me. When pseudoedit was released, I obviously read over the advisory and I remember them saying this. To implement this initial technique, we wrote a rudimentary brute forcer that executes sudo inside of GDB, overflows the user args buffer and randomly selects the following parameters. So this is an example of where I read about an idea. It seemed obvious and I saved it in my head. And facing this exploitation challenge, I recalled that I could try to brute force different parameters. See, uh, this is something, you know, why I also believe uh, you still take something away from watching my videos, even if you don't understand it. When I read over this advisory or skimmed over this advisory, read a little bit of it, I did not understand all of it here. There were so many questions like, how did they get figure this out? I don't understand and so forth. But I read this and that placed a little seed in my head. And when I was actually, you know, I was doing the same project, I was also tackling sudo, but this kind of applies, could apply to any exploitation um, thing. Uh, this made me remember this write up and or, you know, I, I believe my, the idea of this brute forcing, you know, I, I probably saw in here, but, but it's also not like super a secret crazy tip. It could also have been that I maybe, you know, just thought of it because it's obvious to think of that. But what I'm saying is sometimes you pick up on small stuff when you watch and read things, even if you don't understand them. But these small things spark your creativity on your own problems that you are facing for some other stuff. And I read hear that this can be done so um you know it probably in, it probably influenced why i wanted to you know brute force uh, heap layouts um in in a certain in a certain way uh yeah so even if you don't understand videos of mine maybe some ideas or concepts or methodologies stick with yourself and can then be applicable to other stuff you're working on yeah exploitation challenge, I recalled that I could try to brute force different parameters. Now, the advisory specifically talks about which parameters they fuss because they have an actual exploit technique they are going for. But for my learning attempt, I don't want to do that. I don't know this technique, so I want to see if I can figure something out myself, but still using the technique of brute forcing heap layouts. That was the first idea. But I have a sec. Notice my magical cloth switch that was insane it's like magic it's a magic trick uh yeah i i started making this video and i noticed when uh, you know recording and editing it there would be uh twice or three times as long so i know i know because these are so boring dry and stuff i need to make them shorter and this was a good point to stop where we kind of just you know generally talked about our strategies and about the actual implementation this can be its isolated video it makes much more sense to uh, separate them because they are different things than putting them together so yeah i had to re-record an uh, a different ending to that video and then go of brute forcing heap layouts that was the first idea but i have a second idea i thought i could specifically search through the heap for function pointers how would i do that I'm sorry, not telling you just now, but I would love to hear your ideas in the comments below. Next video, I show you how I have done it. Fun fact, uh, some people have suggested this, exactly the idea what I've been going for in the subscription, so that was very cool.